Turn with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter 7. I want to talk about the most sacred thing of this gospel today, and that's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Leviticus chapter 7, verses 26 and 27, Moreover, you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast, in any of your dwellings. Whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Then in the 17th chapter of that same book, the 17th chapter of the book of Leviticus, I want to read verses 10 through 12. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of strangers that sojourn among you, that he eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that make an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Now over into the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 6. I want to read one verse of Scripture. Chapter 6, verse 53 Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of His blood, you have no life in you. Now, for Jews that had lived hundreds of years under the penalty of death for eating or drinking blood, this must have been a very shocking statement. And our Lord said to him, after all of those centuries, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. But what he set forth here was that the blood and the Spirit are one. One. In the, in the, in the economy of God, as we'll show in the message this morning. One is the preparation, the other is the attestation. But in the physical life and in the life of the Old Testament, in this body Jesus said, or God writing through Moses said, the life of the flesh is in the blood. In the Deuteronomy, he made the statement that the blood is life. I don't understand that statement totally. When a human is dead, the blood is still there. But it said that the blood is life. But when you move into the New Testament story, then the Bible said that the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of life. What the liquid blood is to this physical body, the Holy Spirit is to that spiritual body of Christ. It is life. Now, in this testimony of the blood, of the almightiness of the blood of Jesus, I want to begin with this thought of the holiness of the blood of Christ. The holiness. Now, we are familiar with the injunctions throughout the Bible concerning the spotlessness of the Old Testament sacrifices. That sacrifice, before it was ever to be offered, had to be inspected by the priest. They were the eyes of God in looking for any blemish on that lamb. And the slightest blemish meant the immediate rejection of the sacrifice. That, that lamb... Those Old Testament priests become the very eyes of God as they scrupulously looked over that lamb that was become the sacrifice. And in all of that Old Testament story was the type of Christ. But any discovery of a blemish meant immediately, it meant immediately the rejection of that sacrifice. Also, the nature, so likewise, was the blood, and this is a testimony of the holiness of the life of Jesus. That all was a type and a shadow of Him that was to come, God's Lamb. And the, and the scrupulous way that that Lamb was looked at, to be spotless in every way, 
was a testimony of the holiness of the life and the blood of Christ. But it's also a testimony of the nature of that divine deposit in that one that's born again. We are not perfect, but the life of Christ that is within us is perfect. We have the earnest of perfection because, thank God, the blood does cleanse. It doesn't cover sin. It washes sin. It makes us cleanse. Now, when you look at this, the holiness of the blood and the nature, there's two uh, specifics of that blood. One was the shedding and the other was the sprinkling. I want to speak specifically about the sprinkling of that blood to, to you and to those by means of television that may hear this. Now, you know and I know that the shedding of blood relates specifically to the remission of sin. The Bible said without the shedding of blood, there can be no or is no remission of sin. And with the shedding of the blood of Christ, amen, the whole question of sin, guilt, and judgment were dealt with in the shedding of that blood. Nothing is so almighty as the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And in the shedding of that blood, by the shedding of that blood, there is remission of sin. And the whole ground, the whole ground of salvation is secured. It is plus nothing. Christ died in His death and given up the ghost. He said it is finished. The work of eternal redemption was an eternal fact. And because of the death of Christ, Everything else connected with salvation was provided for. I could not be filled with the Holy Spirit had not Calvary been a reality. All of it was secured in that. Now, the sprinkling of that blood is that by which you and I have been brought in to a living fellowship with God. I pray God will help us to know it is by the sprinkling of blood that anything has any audience with the Almighty. And it is by the sprinkling of this blood that we're brought into a vocational living fellowship with God. Now, the tabernacle and the priesthood of old represented not only Israel's salvation, but they represented Israel's ministry to God and for God. All of it. This was a perfect type. Now, although the tabernacle was perfect as a structure, although the priesthood was complete in number and adornment, nothing or no one could function in the sight of God until all had been sprinkled by blood. Everything, altar, labor, table, curtains, candlestick, golden altar, mercy seat, vessels, instruments, ear, thumb, toe, all had to be sprinkled with the blood before they could ever find any place in the sight of God. This blood. Now, nothing lives in the service of God but by and save through the virtue of the sprinkled blood of Christ. Nothing. Not you, not me, nothing, no intellect, nothing apart from the blood of Jesus Christ has found any place in the testimony of God. No one is saved apart from blood, and no one, no one has any service in God apart from the sprinkled blood. The most perfect structure, the extent, most extensive organization, the most devout purpose will fail to function in the eternal interest of God apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost. The fire of God is absolutely essential to spiritual life and victory. I have never been mistaken, ladies and gentlemen. This is not the icing on the cake. The Holy Spirit never comes on a human until that human has been washed in the blood of Christ. But I can tell you in the ongoing process of salvation, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is an absolute necessity. There is no way that a man or a woman can walk and live victoriously apart from the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But we always have to be reminded that the Holy Ghost only comes on that where the blood has been sprinkled. Amen. To believe that you have to talk in tongues to be saved is to try to bypass the only element of this Bible that can bring you into the presence of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit never ushered nothing into the throne of God that had not been sprinkled by blood. It is on that that the Holy Spirit is sanctified, or the blood, rather, has sanctified that the Holy Ghost comes. The blood and the Spirit are one. They always go together. They always go together. One is the preparation, the other as the attestation. Calvary precedes Pentecost, and the cross is the way to glorify Him. Nothing else. It is the cross, amen. To be crucified with Christ is to have put away that flesh on which the oil of the Holy Spirit or the holy oil of the Old Testament could never come. That's the whole terminology and meaning, rather, of the terminology of crucified with Christ. It means that that flesh upon which that holy oil cannot and will not come has been put aside. God will never quicken that which He has rejected. Hear me? I said, God will never quicken that which He has rejected, neither will He glorify and use in His service that which is of man. That which man has put together will never be a part of the service of God. The next factor, though, as we move in this blood, is as the life is its incorruptibility and its indestructibility. When this blood, you see the holiness, that holiness cannot be corrupted. It, it is not something that can be corrupted. When he said, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption, neither will that blood see corruption. And when we look uh, in the blood as the life and into this incorruptibility, and indestructible, let us always bear in mind that what you cannot corrupt, you cannot destroy. If it's incorruptible, then it is indestructible in its very nature. This is a life over which death has no power. Amen. Hell was entered and plundered in the power of this life. You hear me? Jesus entered hell and plundered it. In the life of this blood, in the life that's imparted to us by the blood, all of hell, the domain of Satan, earned Baxter in that notable message, Thy kingdom come, said that when he hung his head and said it is finished and gave up the ghost, the reason for the darkness is that he tied a chain around hell and drug those demons across the universe in a triumph over them openly. He ascended from Calvary to the domain of hell, confronted the devil at the door, and said, I'll take those keys. Thank God in that minute, in a life he plundered hell. That life that cannot die has become my life. Amen. Through the power of this blood, the incorruptible, indestructible life of the blood of Jesus, amen, has become my life and your life as children of the Most High God. When Jesus entered into the domain of darkness in this life and plundered hell, Paul, writing in Colossians, said, He spoiled the devil and made a show of him openly. That was a decisive battle. Amen. There at Calvary, the victory was won. The conclusive battle is to enforce the sentence imposed at that moment when he confronted the devil. Amen. In that moment, when he stood there, and the devil said to him, I know you. I've been looking for you all along the line. I've killed thousands of people along the line of history looking for you. Amen. And Jesus said to him, I'll take those keys. And the devil said to him, there's nobody ever talked to me like that before. And he said, because there's never been anybody like me before. Thank God there's never 
been the person like Jesus before. Hallelujah. He took those keys, unlocked the door, looked into hell, and said to those, you deserve the punishment, slam the door forever. Open the door on the other side of paradise and said, let's get out of here. I purchased a better place by the blood of Calvary. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God. A few, just a little while before Calvary, Elijah and, and uh, had appeared. Moses and Elijah had appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Amen. To have a conference with him and talk about his upcoming death and the victory. I can, you can almost hear him talking to him. He said, oh, there's a lot of them wanted to come, Lord. said, Isaiah, he wrote about all this. He sure wanted to come. But said, all of paradise is filled with people with those credit notes in their hand. Thank God the blood of that Old Testament couldn't wash anything, but it held a hope of a better world, mister. It told about a different blood. There in there with those credit notes waiting for that moment of Calvary when the victory let be one. Listen, the blood of Jesus Christ is the blood that washes, cleanses, makes us perfect in the sight of the Almighty. God will never quicken what is rejected. The next factor in the blood, as I said, is the incorruptible. Satan and his entire kingdom have been broken by the power of this life. Not going to be, ladies and gentlemen, they have been broken. You hear me? In that moment at Calvary, hell was defeated. There was there was spoil, stripped. His only weapon against the church and against the people out there is the deepening of the darkness. That's all he's got left. The Bible said he's blinded the eyes of the people that they can't see the glorious light of the gospel. That's the purpose of the church is the light of the world. Amen. To shine a light into that darkened world so that that man in sin can see that he can walk out if he wants out. Thank God hell has been stripped. A victory has been won. Amen. In his, he who was and is, this book said, lives forevermore as a testimony, as the eternal triumph of His blood over all the enemies of God. Amen. The eternal triumph of the blood of Jesus over all the enemies of God. By His indestructible life, Jesus perfected salvation. I said He perfected salvation. Nothing before was ever perfect, because the mediators constantly had to die. Amen. Nothing was perfect because those that were the mediators. Amen. But this high priest perfects forever because the Bible said he lives by the power of an endless life. He lives in a life that is endless. Now, by his endless life, he has bound you and I to himself. Oh, God, help us to recognize the truth. By that endless life, he has bound us with himself. We share his life by the new birth. We shall never die. We shall never die as we continue in this pathway with God. Death is not a cessation of being. Death is spiritual. You listen to me. Death is not a ceasing to be, but it is spiritual. Life triumphant over death is spiritual, and it means victory over sin, self, the devil, and death. And that's exactly what was accomplished in my life. January the 21st, 1949, at about 9.30 in the evening, I knelt at an altar and saw Christ as a propitiation for my sin. He who knew no sin became sin, that I might become the righteousness of God. And in that moment I received in myself the endless life of Christ. He bound me to Himself. Amen. And gave me victory over sin, self, Satan, and death. And it is in the revelation of the power of this blood that all of it is possible. By, his in, by this indestructible life, the Lord Jesus has inaugurated a work and a ministry which will continue to its ultimate conclusion in spite of every force of earth and hell that hurls itself against it. 
You know, I'm not too sure that America as a republic will stand. I don't know. The corruption has rotted the tissues and the sinews. And inwardly, she's become a place of hell. The nature of her. I'm not too sure she'll survive. I look back across history and the greatest empire of gold from Nebuchadnezzar to this present day. It's gone the way of all flesh. It rose to a peak and fell. I'm going to tell you, I'm a part of that that was cut out without hands that is going to engulf a universe. Amen. Listen, folks. The the kingdom that we're a part of is going to come into being. Nothing is going to destroy this. Don't let the stock market upset you. I said here a few Sundays ago, thank God when she plunged 500 points, and when they blowed up a freighter in, in the Persian Gulf, and when there was a threat of others of terrorism, when the whole world, Israel, in a turmoil, and riots in Korea, the only thing that happened in heaven, they just kept saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, Thou was and is, and are yet to come. And no nervousness in heaven. No, no. And nobody up there believes that there'll ever be a conclusion to that force set into motion by this indestructible life. Empires have been brought to ruins and setting themselves against that which God said He would build. Oh, yes. Look in the back. Most of them, or all of them, one way or another, their dissolution was either direct or indirectly. Them setting themselves against that which God said He would build. I can tell you, after these hundreds of years, the gates of hell have not prevailed against this church. It's still a living force. Amen. It's a blessed thing, folks, to be in and a part of a work secured by the blood of Jesus Christ that will last forever. For a man's work to fall apart when he dies is, 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 is a terrible thing. Amen. I said it's a terrible thing because it means that the work was of man and not of God. Amen. The testimony to which God is reacting in our time relates to a work which stands and persists when every destructive force has spent itself. When all of hell has spent its last atom of energy, there'll still be a church. When the Chevron is out of business, when mobile is gone, AT&T, when they've all been in hell a million years, there'll still be that church bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll still be functioning on the throne of this universe. There are all kinds of alarms today because of rapid and drastic changes. Men are disturbed. I'm just reading this week of a man wrote, he's a, become a Christian, but he is a scientist. In his book he wrote Beyond Science, and he's dealing with the things that science is involved with. The, the creating of nuclear weaponry. It is way back in, in the 30s that, that Einstein, with his M equals C plus something else, uh, meant that a mass of a mass could be created into energy, but it was in 1945 when it happened, and from then the world has been a different place. Man's lived under a shadow. He talked about the genetic structure and all that's happened. How they discovered that the cell in your stomach and your intestines has the same intelligence as the cell in your brain. But something's got it shut off and function. They all have all the information and how man's dealing with that are creating in a, in a, in a wrap what they call a chimera. It's a half wrap and half something else. And he says they believe they can do the same by inserting uh, cells of animals into a human. They can produce some kind of a half animal or something else. But being born again, he never discounted what he saw, but become frightened at what he saw and said the only answer to the things that's happening in our world is to come to a knowledge 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something, folks. There's a fear out there in all the changes. Organized Christianity is in trouble today. You hear me? I said it's in trouble. The, the maintenance of the religious system is demanding all the resource, acumen, wit, schemes, and cunning of men. Never was so many attractions, schemes, methods to keep up the church. They've even gone so far as to have Holy Ghost comedians that are traveling this country. They've got, they've got women, amen, up dancing, supposed to be praising the Lord, training. And as they twirl around and expose themselves, all of it's supposed to be something of the Holy Ghost. All it is, mister, is a scheme trying to get something, keep something going that God's walked off from. They never has. All of this speaks of one thing, failure and defeat. But behind all the religious burlesque and fraud, there is a church, thank God, that the gates of hell will not prevail against. It will not prevail against. Amen. To contend for the faith once delivered to the saints is, is, is more than to merely contend for orthodoxy of doctrine, to champion an evangelical creed, or to be a fundamentalist. I said it's more than that. It is to recognize, listen, earnestly, it is to recognize and earnestly seek that upon which God has set His heart, namely, a people of the altar, the cross, and the blood. That's what God is after. All this ostentatious religious activity, much of it, is nothing but a spirit of Babylon that says, let us build a name for ourselves. But underneath all of that which is religious, there are a people, a people of an altar, of the cross and of the blood. That's the thing he has his heart. A people who have been crucified with Christ and whose life is a testimony of Calvary's victory over every foe of Christ within and without. That's what God is after. A people through which God, by His Spirit, can give Himself. A people through which God, by His, by His Spirit, can give Himself. Now the church, I believe you'll agree, has been victimized by Satan because of her failure to fully recognize the virtue of the precious blood and the value of Him that shed it. That has been the church's downfall in the areas where she's failed. It's a failure to recognize the virtue of that blood and the value of the one that shed it. And saying this, I want to call the attention to the offerings of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. God has made in the last ten days something so rich to my heart about that blood. Oh, he, he whispered to my heart, you must preach it more. You must hold it up more. If anybody's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, it's because there's a ground secured by the blood of Christ. Thank God, the weapons of this warfare is blood, the cross, and the mighty name of Jesus. That blood secures the ground on which I stand. That cross is that which deals with the flesh. And that name hurled from that safety of the blood against the powers of darkness, I Assures the church of triumph over all the evils of night. But we look at these offerings of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And a close study of these offerings will reveal two things. First of all, God has searched out sin. God's traced it to its most hidden secret lair, even to the place of unconsciousness. That's number one. I, I tell you, in studying those, knowing that all of it, there's seven redemptive names of God in the Old Testament. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. But all of you don't have to remember that. You remember one name. The name of Jesus. That's Jehovah Jireh. That's Jehovah Jesus. That's Jehovah all of it, mister. That's the name in which all the fullnesses dwell. Every lamb that ever died on the altar, every burnt offering, every meal offering, every peace offering, all had its climax in Christ. And as I studied this offerings, as I looked through the book of Leviticus and Exodus, as I've studied and looked at these, I've come to realize, ladies and gentlemen, the power of that blood. God, by that blood, has searched sin to its, to its furthest heart and dealt with it. Listen, too, the accidental 
the unwitting, unsuspected, are all taken into consideration. God regards sin now as a state. Listen. God regards sin as a state, not merely as a deliberate, deliberate act. This comes out very clearly in a careful reading of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. That it's a state now and not an act. The second thing, having traced it to its remotest haunt, God has made provision for dealing with it to the very last suggestion. Let me tell you, you don't have to live in gift if you walk honestly before God. If you walk in the light, that blood will take care of the unconscious, the unknown, the unwitting. All sin is taken care of in the process of that blood. Look at it. In, in, in Colossians 4.12, Leviticus 1, Hebrews 10, we have this. A whole burnt offering. That is, that is offered in Leviticus 1. That whole chapter deals with a burnt offering. And, and you read and connect that with Colossians 4.12, Hebrews chapter 10. You discover that the believer, that burnt offering says that the believer may stand accepted and perfect in relation to all the will of God. Isn't that wonderful? I said the blood did that. It isn't, it isn't a, a bow in my neck and being determined. It's a recognizing of the power of that blood. That burnt offering says that I can stand perfectly in the will of God. Then in Leviticus chapter 2, it deals with the meal offering. Connecting that with Romans 12, 1 and 2, Hebrews 10, 10, 13, 21, I made it discover that that meal offering made it possible for me to be able to come into moral perfection, not my own, but presented by faith. That meal offering of the second chapter of Leviticus, God was saying that in myself it can't happen, but by virtue of that blood that's perfect, I can stand and do stand in my perfection with God. I may not be perfected as far as men are concerned, but that blood is a perfect deposit, and God said because of it, I'm going to heaven. Third, you have a peace offering in Leviticus 3, in Colossians 1, 20, and Romans 5, 10. That, that peace offering, that there may be not only access and standing, but fellowship and oneness with God. You know, every time I go to pray, that Scripture says, Come boldly to the throne. That blood made that possible. Every time I repeat that prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, I recognize without Calvary, I could not call him Father, honestly. No, sir, he would not be my Father. Oh, no, not only washed away sin, but gave me a standing in the presence and oneness with God. Then in Leviticus 4 and 5, you have the sin offering. Amen. That sin, that sin in its most positive aspects, sin and ignorance, sin without consciousness, may not interfere with living fellowship by bringing in spiritual death. Amen. You failed and you didn't know it. And before, before this sin offering, ladies and gentlemen, that, whether you knew it or not, would destroy you. But if you walk with Him, then the virtue of this blood, thank God, will keep spiritual death from destroying me, even though I'm not aware of that thing with God all along the line. For 39 years, God has dealt with His heart and revealed things in His heart that He wasn't pleased with. I didn't know that till a particular time. But thank God, because of the blood, I wasn't destroyed. The primary thing in a living testimony of the complete overthrow of Satan then is an adequate apprehension apprehension and appreciation of the Lord Jesus Christ in the value of His blood. Amen. That, that is the primary thing in a living testimony. Overcoming all of hell is a recognizing the value of that blood and the value of the Lord Jesus. Listen, there's something almighty about the death of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God began to talk to me the other morning around 5.30 so I sat in that chair on this. I began to weep. I began to see, amen, something almighty in the death of Christ. 
many people in most of the church, they fail to recognize the important distinction between His crucifixion and His death. Amen. The crucifixion is man's side. The death is His own. All the crosses ever made and all the men that ever conceived them couldn't have put Him on that cross, mister! I'll lay my life down. I'll pick it up. I'll set the priest. I'll make the priest, the devil, and Judas his carrot. Move in line. I'll die when it's time to die. Hallelujah. Oh, there's something when you begin to recognize. Oh, old ladies and gentlemen, there's no armies of this world. No armies of this world could have put him on that cross. No, sir. The preaching of Christ crucified is not preaching of merely what men did to Him, but of what He allowed men to do and what He did through, through what they did. Do you hear me? I said it's not merely preaching what men did to Him, but preaching Christ crucified is a preaching of what Christ allowed men to do to Him and what He did through what they did. That is, He spoiled hell, mister. I said He spoiled hell. He allowed them to hang Him there. He suffered that torment for me. He knew no sin, but He became sin. He bore sin that I might become the righteousness of God. I lay my life down. I take it up. The death of Christ is not man's act, not the devil's act. Sin and Satan and men tried to kill him a thousand times, but his hour had not come. He fixes a time for what he'll do. The rulers say, not on the feast day, but at the supper, he took it out of their hand. And he put Judas under orders. He said, what you going to do, boy? Do it now! Never did lose control. Never. When Jesus lays down His life and takes it up, there's something, there's an infinitude in that deliberate act. And it relates to the universal sovereignty of God. Sin is the principle. The old creation is the spear. Satan is the ruler in that realm. Death is a consequence. And just as the inedible prospect and reality, all of this involved, all this, listen, all of the above are dealt with. And that regime of brought to an end as far as God is concerned. In that moment, the whole thing centers in the person of Christ. That person that Christ became that day, that person must be able to both act as representative of man, rejected of God because of sin, and as representative, receive all the judgment of God upon man and sin. And yet at the same time, because sin is not inherent in himself, render the impossible for that dark world to hold him. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, sir. He said to the devil and the demons and religion, I yield to you every atom till you exhaust yourself as man for man. I yield myself. But he said, there's another in me over which you have no power. And just like Haman built his gallows for Mordecai and swung on him himself, when you're through, devil, I'll have you on it. Amen. I'll have you on the altar. Because he had no sin. All the sin that was nailed on him was my sin and your sin. He went to Calvary for mine. But because he was utterly, utterly and completely free from sin himself, death was not able to hold him. Amen. Death was not able to hold him. He came forth victorious. And when he stood in that garden that day, he said, because I live, you can live. Amen. Because I've overcome. He sat down at the right hand of the Father and made this earth his footstool. When I was born again, the Holy Ghost baptized me into Christ. And when Christ sat down and put his foot on the devil, I sat down with him. I'm as safe as if I was in heaven with a door locked. Stand with me and let's worship God. Hallelujah. Stand up and let's worship Him here this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Worship Him, folks. Worship Him. You folks in this television audience, we're getting ready to leave you. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood. 
it reaches, like the song said, to the highest mountain, to the lowest valley. It reaches you where you are, no matter what you're saying, no matter what your problem. That blood can wash you. Oh, you're bound by alcohol, drugs, homosexuality. Your life is a mess. And I present to you that which can make you a new man, new woman in Christ. Kneel where you are. Let Jesus come in today. Wash me in thy blood. Cleanse me in the name of Jesus. Good night to you. Hallelujah. Worship him, folks. That, that song we sing, we're standing on holy ground. Surely we are this morning. I said, surely we are standing on holy ground. The blood, the blood, the almighty blood of the Lord Jesus to wash away every sin. Every head, every Christian pray. And listen, if you're here without the Savior, I've got to help you this morning. If you're here without Him, then I've told you the way to God. This blood, this blood. You don't have to leave here a sinner. It's not a works of righteousness which you can do or have done. It's by the grace of God and Jesus bore your sins. The only, only thing you need to see the way out. Christ said, I'm that way. You can walk out of that drug habit. Walk out of that sin. You can walk out of whatever it is. You can be free. However head is bowed, every eye closed, I want you to lift your hand if you need Christ this morning. Just slip it up if you're not saved. You may be a backslider, but you're not right with God. The blood of Jesus Christ washes away every sin. Just slip up your hand here this morning. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come where you are, but I am going to believe. God will. God bless you, sir. Yes, in the name of Jesus. Quickly, others, God bless you. In the name of Jesus, just slip your hand up. God bless you to my left. God bless you there. Quickly, others, Jesus loves you. He died for you. You can be saved. You're not bound. You have the least desire in that heart to be right. You can be right. You're not beyond the reach of that blood. It reaches to the highest mountain. To the lowest valley. It can reach you wherever you are. Are the others quickly before we pray? I want to believe for you this morning. Just slip that hand up. In the name of Jesus. You get a hold of them children. Don't let them that aisle. They don't need to go nowhere. Every head. Listen. Are the others before I pray? Slip that hand up. God bless you. God bless you, sir. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of Jesus.